Well, our next panel brings together four, and I mean four powerhouse labor leaders who represent nurses, teachers, retail workers, and not to mention the entire AFL-CIO to discuss how the pandemic is impacting essential workers and how they're adapting through and to a technology. We're gonna, we're gonna look at where we are now and discuss what the future looks like for essential workers. Now, if you have questions, please, I want you to go directly to today's uh, that you wanna share with these guests. Please submit the questions to sagafter.org slash summit questions. That's sagafter.org slash summit questions. And to moderate this panel, it's great to have with us and hand, uh, hand it over to Ryan Heath. Hello, Ryan, senior editor at Politico and author of Politico's Global Translations newsletter. Very excited to have you here and to have all of you with us. So thank you, take it away. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. And it really is a star-studded panel that we've got for you over the next hour. Um, I, where I wanna take this conversation is to explore how we go from technology being something that happens to workers to becoming something that workers can shape and benefit from. We know that inequality is eating away at the heart of America, and we're told that innovation is part of American DNA. So how can we flip that script and make sure that the benefits of technology are being shared with everyone? Now, our panelists don't need much of an introduction, but I'm going to give them one anyway because they do deserve it. So first up, we have Randy Weingarten. She's not just one of the most prominent union leaders in America, but in the world. And she represents 1.7 million education professionals. She's been through countless political battles, and I'm sure it's going to be the same again in 2021 as we navigate reopening schools. We've also got Bonnie Castillo, one of Time 100's most influential people in 2020. And via her leadership of National Nurses United, she's been calling attention to the shocking lack of personal protective equipment that her members have been dealing with throughout 2020. We've got Mark Perrone, who as international president of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, his members are keeping us fed via supermarkets, meat processing plants. They face truly atrocious exploitation sometimes in 2020. And I'm sure you've been reading about his union's latest battles for hazard pay. And last but not least, you just heard from Liz Schuler. We're bringing her back out again. You can see that she's an innovator and a fighter and also one of the driving forces behind the union movement's new technology institute. So with that under our belt, I'm gonna to turn to you first, Randy. Um, I'd love for you to make some opening comments. And I have a, a basic question that actually I'll ask everyone as they, as they come in with comments. N95 masks, the most basic technology of all. Should they be mandatory and free for all of your members in schools? And is it going to take some kind of federal government regulation or order to achieve that? Take it away. Yes, they should be mandatory. Yes, they should be free. Um, yes, they should be. Um, yes, no one should have to actually put them in a bag to recycle and reuse them. So and um, I'm so glad that we're here with with that. I'm here with um, these. Um, great you know labor leaders i mean i think that we have seen this year and um bonnie and i share we don't we both represent we represent about two hundred thousand nurses in the private sector as well and have gone through these wars in terms of ppe and and other protective equipment but at the end of the day what you have here in some um a crazy way when it comes to education is the obverse of what we would have talked about last year about technology. What we're seeing is a huge renunciation of remote education. We know that kids really need to be back in in-school learning provided that it is safe. And we also know that there is a roadmap to make it safe. I was, I, you know, had it right in front of me. We can put it in the chat. Part of it is, I mean, we have like a two page roadmap on how to make it safe. The reason I say that is yes, it's complicated to make things safe in the middle of a pandemic, but we just cheered people going to the moon. We cheer when we lift up a rocket ship we know how to make things safe when we prioritize them. But what has happened here is that we have not prioritized essential workers, even though they are doing essential work. 
And so to answer your first question, Ryan, of course we should have N95s. MERV 13 filters are effectively having an N95 in a classroom to have that kind of circulation. We need to do that in all sorts of different places. So there's a pathway to making schools safe. I'm happy to go through you know, all of it. It's something that our union has fought for since last April, asking the federal government, the then Trump federal government for things like the data on what was happening in schools. So you don't have to hear it on a direct message from a teacher in Indiana who's telling me how her husband, another teacher was just hospitalized and was really concerned about what his um, kids were gonna do when he was in the hospital for two or three weeks instead of actually being protected. That information about people who have gotten sick in schools should be out there, not hidden. The guidance for how we actually make sure that, that people are safe in schools. We shouldn't have had to wait to a Joe Biden administration three weeks into that administration to get guidance from the CDC. And we shouldn't have to wait to have this rescue plan as important as it is right now to get the resources to do it. So there's a way, we know it's important. We know kids need in school learning. We know that this last year has shown that remote education is not an adequate substitute but we need to actually have the willingness to actually do this, not the hypocrisy of Republicans, sorry to be so political, but I'm gonna be political for the moment. People who allow Trump to make things incalculably worse and not give us the resources and the support we need, now turning around and blaming us, not right, not fair, we won't take it, and we will fight for what's right. Thank you, Randy. And I should point out that just this week, a Politico poll said that 55% of Americans are on your side, or in fact, even go further than some of the things yeah. you're asking for, and said that schools shouldn't have to open until every teacher in those schools has been vaccinated. So you are being backed up there by the right. public. And, and frankly, last thing I'll say is we just did a poll of our members. 85% of our members, it's not that they're not fearful, 71% are fearful they're gonna bring COVID home to their families. But 85% of our members said, if we have the layered mitigation that CDC just talked about, you know, including going back to masks, physical distancing, cleaning, ventilation, and the accommodations, obviously that we need. If we have the, um, the testing that, you know, industry has, that, that the film industry has when they're reopening anything that the NFL had so that you can see asymptomatic spread. And we have vaccines, not even vaccine prerequisite, but vaccine prioritization. 85% of my members would be comfortable being back in school because they know how important it is for our kids. Thank you, Randy. That's a perfect segue to you, Bonnie, because it does feel like some of the time the protocols that exist in other parts of society are actually stricter and more supportive of us than they are of your members who are actually right on the front line and in the most danger of almost anybody, um, we might say. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about how they're feeling now in this situation, and we'll get later into things like telemedicine and, and other tech impacts. Sure. Yeah, no, I'll touch upon that. And yeah, to answer your questions. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, it, it's an honor to be here with, you know, my fellow panelists. And I really want to thank SAG after for and the leadership of the union for having me. But, you know, nurses know that technology can be skill enhancing, uh, including technology that actually uh, enabled us to engage in powerful solidarity during uh, COVID-19 and you know we have an international organization Global Nurses United and we've been holding some uh, webinars with nurses and healthcare worker unions in other countries and our colleagues in Italy which was hit hard early were able to warn us that their employers actually sent nurses uh, who had recovered from COVID back to work with less protective equipment claiming that 
antibodies would protect them. Uh, and you know, obviously we knew that that wasn't, they knew that that wasn't the case. We knew that as well. But with that early warning, it enabled us to prepare to fight against our employers uh, doing the same. All that being said, yes, we see technologies being used um, by people who are not caregivers and in ways that degrade uh, nurses' skills and, and quite frankly, threaten patients' lives. So for nurses, this is deeply personal. And uh, if this pandemic has shown us anything, it has, uh, it is how important it is for patients to have hands-on care. During uh, COVID, I, uh, you know, we've seen patients, they've been told to remain at home and their families have had to measure uh, you know, their loved one's oxygen saturation level, not really knowing when is the right time to go to the hospital. Uh, the automated appointment systems, they're not always uh, efficient or accurate in terms of connecting uh, patients with appropriate medical uh, providers. And so um, what we've seen is patients are sicker uh, when they come and, and um, too often it's, it's, it's too late. So, uh, you know, hands on care is optimal care. That's the only way we can heal patients and control this pandemic. We can't effectively treat COVID patients remote, remotely. That, that, and especially those without reliable Wi-Fi or even digital services. Um, so we've known for a long time too uh, that the healthcare industry is focused on profits, not optimal care. They close hospitals and units um, in order to save money. And they, um, they use these strategies that are modeled off of the auto industry in terms of just-in-time staffing, uh, stocking, which has left them unprepared for uh, this pandemic and, and other emergencies. Uh, so the other thing that I will say is that, you know, nursing um, it comprises approximately 50% of the hospital operating uh, expenses. So they've tried to use technology to cut our workforce. And um, uh, however, um, the industry has had to comply with health and safety regulations that protect nurses, workers, and these were fought for and won by the labor movement, which has, that has limited their ability to replace uh, nurses and workers. And when COVID, the COVID obviously happened um, during the pandemic, what we have seen is, as you mentioned, a complete disregard for patients, nurse safety from lack of protections to lack of a surge plan with a disproportionate impact on black brown and indigenous communities and nurses. In fact, we are still hearing from nurses who are being told to wear one N95 respirator mask for an entire shift or in some cases for uh, a week. And to add, uh, you know, really insult to injury within days of the pandemic, the Trump administration, and in some states uh, pushed through a, the hospital industry wish list, rolling back crucial regulations. We have so much to recover. Uh, and they paved the way for, uh, you know, this widespread use of untested, um, unproven technology like Battelle. Um, this is just one example, was an awarded uh, an emergency use authorization by the FDA, $400 million contract. Um, by the US government to supposedly decontaminate N95 respirators. There is no safe or effective way to do that. And this effort was a Trump administration priority. And they and he also uh, issued uh, an executive order to expand telehealth in August, 2020. So it's no, it should be no surprise that there's um, a big effort to make these conditions permanent. And, um, but it's focusing, you know, on capitalizing the profit that has made uh, our system so unprepared in this pandemic. And, you know, as I said before, well, it makes sense to utilize telehealth where it's appropriate. Uh, it's clear that the healthcare industry is taking advantage of COVID-19 to just ram through uh, policy changes that, uh, you know, are designed with the goal of de-skilling, automating, outsourcing, uh, and, and this clearly would threaten safe patient care conditions. And all of you and us, you know, will be patients at some time 
in our lives. So, uh, you know, really um, to summarize, it would, all, it would make us all much more vulnerable in future pandemics, less secure. The only way I think really to ensure that technology serves patients you know, over profits is, is um, to build power in our workplaces. That's what we're doing now in terms of fighting back, but power in our workplaces, in our communities and fighting back. And um, I look forward to actually um, fighting back with all of my um, counterparts here and my uh, sisters and brothers and um, look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now turning to you, Mark, your members are being crunched uh, from many different angles. We Many people will know about the Amazon effect already and this acceleration of rushing to online shopping and the impacts that has on bricks and mortar stores and workers themselves. Many of your workers do not enjoy a living wage. So there is the battle not only for hazard pay in this pandemic, but to have a better minimum wage. Um, maybe kick us off by letting us know where those battles are at. And we've just heard in recent days that President Biden is going to governors and mayors now saying that it doesn't look like this $15 minimum wage is going to happen right now. How are you feeling about all of those tumultuous factors that are impacting your members? Well, first of all, uh, let me uh, congratulate the rest of the panel, uh, both Randy and Bonnie. Uh, I wanna thank you guys for being as supportive as you've been uh, towards my members. And Ryan, thank you for moderating this panel and, and certainly Gabrielle for putting it together. Um, look, I think that I'll answer your question that you asked first, and that was the same as Randy did. Yes, I think my members should be able to have N95 masks. Yes, I think it ought to be mandated. Uh, but quite honestly, uh, I wonder whether or not my employers would provide them uh, when they won't mandate masks to the customers that are coming in because they're concerned about how it may represent the bottom line. Um, you know, the UFCW represents over a million essential and frontline workers in grocery stores, meat packing, food processing, retail, pharmacies. Uh, yes, we represent some healthcare workers and senior care facility workers. You know, but before this pandemic, the work that our nation's food and retail workers did that was often ignored uh, and taken for granted. By some, they were seen as easily replaceable until there was a pandemic, until people didn't want to go out. The truth is they were wrong. It proved how much this nation depends on an army of essential workers and that the national necessity of these hardworking men and women has come at an incredible personal uh, and emotional cost. You know, Randy talked about her survey of her members we just did a recent survey, over 90% of our members remain deeply concerned about this virus. In fact, more than half are more concerned today than they were 30 to 60 days ago, even though the numbers of the number of hospitalizations are down. This is their reality daily. You know, but regardless of the COVID fears or health threats these workers feel and experience, they don't have a choice. They can't work from home. They must go to work, risk their lives, simply to survive financially. You know, tragically, this has come at a high human cost. As of today, we've had at least 400 of our frontline food workers that have died because of this virus. Over 77,000 have been infected or exposed, and quite frankly, uh, we believe that those numbers are much higher because we don't have transparency either. There is no legal or regulatory requirement for companies to disclose when their workers become exposed of COVID-19 or pass away from it. Tragically, what this pandemic has exposed is not only an inequality in the workplace risks that workers face, but an inequality of workplace consequences. You know, just recently, a governor uh, in New York was under investigation by the FBI because maybe the numbers that they provided were fudged. What's happening with the corporations? Why aren't they being investigated? 
Simply put, workers who must go on to work and they risk and they have a higher price of that risk because they may not be able to come home. We all know that if in fact you take more risk, you should be paid more. This is an enduring and defining lesson that this nation must immediately address. In any other facet, as I said, when one faces higher risk, they're paid more. But for essential workers, hazard pay is an exception. It's not the rule. This is the case, even though the National Bureau of Economic Research found 55% li higher likelihoods that they would test positive for COVID among essential workers than those classified as non-essential. In short, this pandemic has changed the way that we work, but it's also changed as a nation how we value work. Looking ahead, I have to tell you, I'm grateful to be a part of this discussion. There are critical, critical, albeit tragic lessons that we have to take away from this pandemic. First, companies must pay essential workers more when they face more risk, period. Corporate profit margins can't be used as an excuse to ignore the sacred responsibility that we have to protect all workers, especially those that are putting their lives on line. Second, workplace and health and safety for essential workers must be redefined as a matter of public safety in real public policy. For example, our union was the first to call for a mask mandate, but governors ignored it for political reasons. This is a critical safety effort. To this day, companies refuse to enforce those mask mandates like other measures like social distancing. And thirdly, we must be a legal and regulatory consequences when a company doesn't do enough to protect its workers, but in my case, also the public. Lastly, we must have a serious discussion of benefits and perfections that workers and workplaces require in an age of global pandemics. Paid sick leave when a worker is exposed to COVID, providing paid time off for vaccinations and revaccinations, or prioritizing essential workers for vaccines shouldn't be options granted by so-called good companies, but should be mandated by all companies. Lastly, let me thank you all for being on this call and your shared concern on how to improve the lives of not just food and retail workers, but all workers, irrespective of their industry or their profession. Because if there's one thing this terrible health crisis has taught us, hopefully, it's this, our lives, our health, our safety depend on our shared actions. And each of these actions, when guided by purpose, will help build a better America that all of our families deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Now time to bring in Liz Shuler. Liz, we've just heard about a lot of very basic innovations that could be brought into American workplaces. And you had the chance to sit with the president on Wednesday. Um, give us the download. Um, did you raise these tech issues with him? And, and what's your reaction to, to what the other leaders have just said? Well, um, just want to say thank you. Of course, it's an honor to be a part of this panel. And I, as I listened to, you know, Randy and Bonnie and Mark, I was just marveling at these are leaders that are on the front lines. Their members are making sacrifices every day. And to have them on this panel is incredible because they are bringing to this conversation what is happening on the ground. And I hope, Ryan, you're, you're also listening because I think that story doesn't get out there enough, right? Um, and so I want to thank you as well for guiding our discussion today. Um, there's no how-to manual uh, as to how we get through the worst public health crisis in a century. Um, and so today I think this panel is to talk about, you know, innovation, technology, but how the pandemic has actually hastened that. Um, and I think you heard from all of them, you know, the concerns that we see as, as working people. We're hopeful that things are going to continue to get better under the leadership of this administration. Um, off to a great start. We're already seeing progress. And you heard, you know, Bonnie and, and Randy talk about the failures of the last administration and, and how millions of workers have had to go to work in fear and, and feel vulnerable and unprotected 
because of the lack of a plan. Um, so I think the stories that we're hearing from, from the three of them, I, I feel the need also to bring into the room the stories from, uh, from some of our other affiliated unions who are representing workers in factories, you know, who are keeping supply chains humming and the bus drivers and flight attendants who are helping people travel and, you know, caregivers risking their lives who are, who are comforting our, um, you know, the elderly and the disabled, right? Uh, not to mention the federal, state, and local public sector workers who are providing the life-saving services uh, on the ground. Public transit workers, Amtrak, you know, on our, our transportation systems, um, construction workers who are showing up every day despite the risks. Um, I could go on and on. Postal workers, right, who are making sure our packages and our mail and our prescriptions get delivered. Um, and I think Mark is right that they have been taken for granted. And just now are we seeing that acknowledgement of how essential our essential workers are. Um, and COVID-19 has, has truly touched every sector, but it has also hit some communities harder than others. And we've touched on the disproportionate impacts um, that you know, black and brown and indigenous people are, are dying at higher rates. Um, women uh, are unemployed at higher rates. You've been hearing this term, the she session, right? Because of the lack of safety net that we have and how women are now bearing the disproportionate impacts of care. Um, and you know, what that's had, the impact that that's had on the economy. And so many victims of the virus have been the people who have kept our country fed and safe and, and who are running through this pandemic on the front lines. So um, what I worry about is uh, exactly what we're here to talk about today is the, the rapid acceleration of technology and the consequence of how technology then, based on what we've seen through the pandemic, how this technology then will start to change the way we work forever. Um, and how the, as we've seen inequality spiral out of control even before the pandemic, right? How is that going to shape the future of work? And, um, you know, is it gonna be that we continue to see rights um, be chipped away? And are we gonna let the wealthy and the powerful you know, continue to drive the train? Or are we gonna be able to come together, continue to expand opportunities and power for working people to stand up and advocate for themselves and, and make that change? And so um, I think that's what the, the whole notion of technology and how we transform work um, is, is gonna be built around. Um, so I guess, um, you know, we feel in the labor movement that we can actually reduce that, that gap and, and narrow inequality and start to see the prosperity and, you know, that's created through all this increased productivity be more sh uh, shared broadly. And um, the only way we think we can do that is by expanding rights and power and access to unions and collective bargaining that we know so well in the labor movement, but that is rarely seen in the technological space, you know, that, that a lot of people who are in the, these emerging industries really don't have access to. Um, so it's a turning point. Um, it's not an either or. And I think as we chart our course forward, um, we need to make sure that these disruptions that we're seeing uh, inevitably lead to a stronger labor movement that can really change the, the course of the conversation and the thinking about innovation. Thank you so much, Liz. And thank you for being patient, uh, Randy. Um, time to bring you back into the conversation. Um, I've got a bit of a double-headed question for you. So I apologize that it's a little bit complicated, but uh, you, know, you can tell from my accent, I'm not American, I'm an Australian. And so this is a question about broadband. So I come from a country <laughs> where there's a national broadband network because there was recognized that this would be essential for the country's future. I spent most of the last 20 years working in Europe where broadband is frankly quite cheap, quite fast and nearly universal. And because I wanted to ask you about the reality of virtual learning and where uh, 
teachers need more technology to do a better job and where are the red lines uh, for you as a union? Um, I realized I couldn't ask that question without asking you, is America's broadband situation actually also an education crisis? It feels like it is the building block and the stumbling block that sits in front of that other question about the technology you want more of and the technology that you're frustrated with at the moment in the classroom. Yes, um, it is both a building block and a stumbling block for all the reasons you just said. And, you know, we, you know, we believe in an America that is big hearted and that welcomes everyone here. <laughs> and so we love that you're here, Ryan. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, we just want to make sure that everyone has a path to citizenship. So it's great that Joe Biden has introduced a new um, comprehensive um, plan for citizenship. So welcome. So the, the um, you know, the, Liz just said it. I mean, we, we all, and, and these are, you know, amazing uh, leaders and so honored um, to be, you know, in this kind of virtual setting with what SAG-AFTRA normally does in terms of this, you know, amazing technology conference. Um, and, and by being in this setting, you know, it is part of seeing how our world has really, really changed around and amongst us in terms of the last um, year. And it's almost been a year now. Um, uh, what you have in America is you have, a, and I'm sorry, I'm kind of being the social studies teacher that I am. You have a constant fight, like de Tocqueville saw, you know, from the very beginning of the kind of locking and social contract and we're all in this together and the rugged frontiers person. And, you know, that capital is that, that, you know, we're all, we just have to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and figure it out by ourselves. And, you know, those who do succeed and those who don't, don't. And we're pretty schizophrenic about these two, um, different pushes and prods in America. And so where you had, for example, um, in the New Deal, mm -hmm. an understanding that the electrification of America was absolutely necessary to lift people out of poverty, that when you fast forward to um, the um, invention of the internet and, um, and, and how you know, and you've gone from radio waves to broadband, um, we're basically back into the dog eat dog, you know, whoever can afford it can do it, as opposed to that, this being a, a public good. And so as a result, what has happened this year, for example, is that 16 million kids of the 50, you know, 2 million, 53 million kids that we educate every single day, public and private, pre-K through 12, 16 million of them still don't have a year into this pandemic um, appropriate broadband or appropriate equipment. You cannot spend your day doing schoolwork on an iPhone. You can barely spend your day doing schoolwork on a computer or an iPad that all of us are on doing this um, session. Most kids, I often say, most kids and their parents can't afford, we spend, my partner and I, she's a rabbi, she's about to do services in the other room, we spend $250 a month on high-speed internet. Obviously, we can afford it. What happens to kids and their families? So, so it's, it is, um, uh, it, it is where inequity shows up when we are into having to deal with technology as an absolute given in the middle of a pandemic and kids do not have the, um, the internet broadband to do that. So should it be part of the infrastructure bill that Joe Biden is pushing and you know, and, and in the Recovery Act, absolutely. Should we be doing this like we electrified 
um, the United States in in the 19 you know 30s and 40s? Absolutely. Should it be free like radio waves are? Absolutely. But we have to do more than that because the the next piece in terms of all those platforms for educators, again, nothing is made free. It should be absolutely free for educators across the nation to have up-to-date platforms that are usable um, you know, in, in, in every single school district. But what we have seen, and this has been um, a, a non-reported story, that, the, that, that when it came to trying to go from basically most teachers not using technology in, in, in any real regard other than, you know, their own personal email and, you know, sometimes doing FaceTime or using Facebook um, with their families and friends. Um, districts and teachers actually work pretty hard to band-aid and patch things together. The question becomes in the next, in the 2.0 world, in the world that SAG AFTRA, AFTRA envisions, let's figure out how we can give kids who have the least the best platforms. Let's work with the tech companies. Let them, you know, let's figure out how they make money, but let's work with the tech companies that the gold standard is for places like East St. Louis or for LA or for poor neighborhoods in New York City. And as we're doing it, Let's actually make sure it's not just the kids that have this, but their families. Absolutely, thank you, Randy. Um, now, Bonnie, if I can turn to you, I wanted you to give us some perspectives on what it's like to be a nurse in this growing telemedicine environment. And the reason I ask that is that I know a lot of younger people, and I, I don't quite count as that anymore, but I'd probably include myself in, in um, sort of the next comment. You know, I like the idea of booking appointments online and I, I want to know on the spot what my insurance covers or doesn't cover and so on. But I think a lot of us don't see any other perspective on those digital systems. We don't know whether your members get any benefit out of it. We don't know where the cost savings that come from running those systems go to, whether it's straight to profit, is it into nurses' pockets sometimes. Tell us a bit how that system is affecting your members now that it's becoming part of the everyday reality of, of receiving healthcare? Sure, so I mean, I think actually, and I think, you know, Randy makes a really good point in her conclusion of those 16 million uh, children uh, without broadband internet connectivity, that's 16 uh, million families who are patients, potential patients also that, don't have access to, uh, you know, that kind of internet connectivity to make those kinds of appointments. Some people obviously, you know, do and may and obviously may enjoy that, you know, in terms of the, um, well, quite frankly, maybe even not wanting to go into the healthcare system, largely, you know, because there is some fear right now with regards to a lack of protections. And so we're seeing that. And quite frankly, that's concerned to us because people that are having chest pain or you know some very serious symptoms need care. So um, you know, I think that uh, you know those uh, you know, and and that I think goes across you know whether you're talking about inner city or rural um, areas where you know they are where they don't have access um, to that uh, that kind of technology. And, and that's where nurses go, is to those that actually are vulnerable and are in need of care and we prioritize. Um, the other thing that I'll say is, you know, we're familiar with uh, where some technology, even things I had mentioned before on um, family members having to uh, monitor the oxygenation, blood oxygenation with these oximetry devices. And there was a recent study that um, actually showed that um, uh, the blood oxygenation, oxygenation in COVID-19 um, patients, maybe um, the oximetry units themselves miss three times more cases of, that have uh, in black patients than in white patients in terms of uh, hypoxemia. That 
you know, obviously is very dangerous. So, you know, I think for us, um, we, technology, uh, you know, has its benefits and its benefits for some, but it certainly, you know, for so many, it doesn't. And I will say there is a generational gap here too, in terms of some of our elderly patients. Some may have, you know, be really with uh, SNAP on, on the technology, others, others aren't. And as I said, they're more vulnerable and they need um, more care. And so, uh, you know, it is, um, you know, it has, it has its limitations. And obviously I, we understand the attraction and especially to, you mentioned the young, younger generation and, you know, those that have the resources and have the ability, you know, it's fine. Now, I think everybody is very frustrated though when they can't get through. And it just seems to, you know, go round and round and round. And then we deal with a lot of people that are very frustrated and angry by the time they do get an appointment and do, you know, are able to see to see us. So um, I think it's mixed. I really do think it's mixed. Yep. And mixed isn't good enough. Um, so no. thank you for that, Bonnie. Um, Mark, time to, to turn to you again. Um, when I think of the effects of technology on a lot of your workers, especially retail, it just has become synonymous with insecure work. Um, is there anything I'm missing in that picture there? Can we reframe it in some way so that technology isn't just driving sort of gig work and at work and underpaid work uh, for, for your members and the people that work in your sectors? And I know a lot of people want to support them. Uh, is there anything, and this is an audience question, that the people listening today can do beyond retweeting, beyond signing a petition that can, can actually help your members today? Well, Ryan, let me say the following. I think that we've been dealing with uh, gig work for a very long time. When I started to work in the food stores um, 46 years ago, I was a part-time worker. Uh, so we've been dealing with gig work for a long time. I think that, um, you need to recognize a couple of things. Um, whether or not you're talking about these new services like Instacart or Shipped, um, or whether or not things are being delivered to your house with Amazon Fresh, uh, you, you need to understand that they can't necessarily train those workers to provide you with the product that you would normally select if you went to the facility yourself. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is that uh, our major corporations like Amazon's going to have is that last mile and can they get the product there and will it be actually what the customer wanted and as high as food prices have gotten especially since the pandemic um, I think people want to make sure that whatever they're receiving uh, presents that value to them so what can you ask me what can you do uh, I think that you ought to recognize that you're going to pay a higher price for those services uh, in, a, in an area where food is already, uh, in some cases, uh, especially good food, okay, has been priced out of some people's uh, economic uh, realm. And we have to be concerned about that. And so I think that you can walk into a store or you can notify the company uh, that you don't think it's appropriate, right? Uh, that they use technology in a way uh, that further puts more money in their pocket uh, and does not share uh, that wealth. Every single uh, panelist that you had on today had made a reference to, uh, was the money going to the workers or was it going to improve the bottom line of the profit center? Every single uh, representative said that. And that's our concern, right? If you're gonna increase productivity, if you're gonna work at a higher risk, you should receive a portion of that. We as a society have got to decide that it is not appropriate for people to take more risks or people to improve their productivity without it being shared across the economic scale. If we don't do that, if we don't confront some of the ownership or corporate power that has taken over our country, we are gonna have more and more haves and have nots 
there's going to be more and more disruption like we saw on January the 6th. If we allow automation to do some of the things that they have made projections that as many as 45% of our population could be unemployed by 3035. If we don't decide as a society that we're going to take that issue on, then what we're gonna see is mass disruption in our society, our infrastructure is gonna drop, our ability to educate our children is gonna be a challenge. And we, as we know it, this country as we know it, is going to change from being the place that people want to go to, to the place that people want to run away from. Thank you, Mark. Um, I have to say my reporting bears a lot of that out, that it really is going to take greater involvement at a federal level, but they're not excluding other levels of government in taking charge of the effects of technology and a greater investment as well in coordinating new and different skills. We can't just leave it to individuals to figure this out on their own. Um, our interpreters have been working very hard, so we're going to have to wrap this session up very soon. Um, but Liz, can I turn it over to you, maybe just for a brief 60 second wrap up comment about the takeaway that you really want people to leave this panel with? Wow, um, no big lift in 60 seconds. Just, um, you know, I think a lot of people think that the labor movement is of the past, you know, that we're outdated, we're outmoded, that we're a closed club and we wanna just bury our heads in the sand when it comes to technology. And I would say that we are quite the opposite, um, even though we do have concerns about how technology will be used and implemented and whether there'll be a worker voice um engage in it we're also very much partners in how we can craft a future of work that will benefit everyone and i think there's so many examples of how this can go well where workers are brought to the table in partnership to um you know implement as we uh, heard in the previous uh panel i i talked about marriott you know and how hotel uh workers are at the table actually with a voice a notice period before technology comes in they use collective bargaining to make sure there's training funds for people to train up to the next opportunity. So we can actually be partners in crafting a future that works for everyone, or technology can be can go badly, right? Um, if you don't involve a worker voice. So I think the lessons here are that, you know, we want to make sure the future is a future of shared prosperity. And the labor movement is really the only force left in the United States that has the power and scale to make sure workers can get the share of the pie that they help create. Thank you, Liz. And make sure if you haven't already, please check out the AFL-CIO Technology Institute and follow the work that Amanda Ballantyne and everyone else there are going to be doing in the coming months. I wanna thank each of our panelists for joining us and illuminating all of these important issues. And now it's time to hand it back to Gabrielle. We're almost at the end of today's program, so stick with us for these last sessions. Thank you, Ryan. That was beautiful. You did a great job. And I want to say thank you really to Randy and to Bonnie and to Liz and to Mark. You are outstanding leaders. And I, I think that what I'm really hearing here, and I want to remind everybody, what you're saying is you're supporting workers. Unions support workers. Workers are people. People are what makes this country and our world function and live and breathe. It's our brothers and sisters. And um, so I really appreciate all the things that you do to make sure that we have a voice and that we really have a future and we can work with dignity and respect. You did a beautiful job. Thank you so much. Thank you.